Yes, it's good to good to be back. I'm let's see, I'm off mute here. Yes, I'm on and off mute. So do you have you have me? Still no, almost no, almost yes. I have power and I'm not on mute. No, yes. Pardon me. I can spit. You can hear me. Okay. I mean, I won't. I won't need it. I can. I could project if I wanted to. But um, yes, it's good to be back. I'm feeling great, and so I uh, appreciate all the prayers. Your pastor checked up on me, and I appreciated that. And uh, I was sad that I had to miss your Easter week. I understand that was amazing, and I really wish I could be here. Maybe, maybe next year. We'll see. That would be great. Um, let me ask you a question this morning, and uh, this is one of those where you can you know, show of hands. How many of you have ever heard someone say, you reap what you sow? Have you ever heard? Yeah, that, that's pretty popular. How many of you have ever heard that when people explain this, that they explain that basically what it means is uh, what goes around comes around? Have you ever, you ever heard that? Yeah, that's pretty popular. For example, you know, if you're mean to people, uh, don't be surprised if people are mean to you because, you know, hey, you reap what you sow, right? You've heard that before. Or maybe you've heard people explain it as a, that it's something like uh, karma. You know, if you do good things in your life, then good things will happen to you. Um, or if you're a bad person and you do bad things, then you should expect trouble or pain or bad things to happen to you, you know, because it's, it's karma. You know, you get what you deserve. You reap what you sow. Now, you don't have to raise your hands, but would I surprise you if I told you that you reap what you sow has absolutely nothing to do with those uh, ideas? So why do so many Christians uh, and other people think this way? I mean, I've heard lots of people out in the world and lots of Christians, and we've all heard that phrase. Why do we say that? Why do we think that that's what that means? Well, what has happened is over the years, people have been given Bibles and told that they need to, you know, you need to start reading your Bible. But many times they're not taught how to read the Bible. You see, the Bible can't be read like it's a theological textbook or an encyclopedia of Christian topics where you just go to a topic, you read the entry, and that's what you get. It includes stories of real people and historical events. But it also contains poetry and wisdom literature. It contains proverbs and prophecy. And it also contains letters which were written by real people to real people in order to deal with specific problems that they were facing. Now the statement, you reap what you sow, comes from the book of Galatians. And while we may call it a book, it's the book of Galatians, it's really a letter from Paul to a group of people who are living in Galatia. And because it's a letter, we need to read it in a way that's different than how we might read the book of Proverbs, for example. Um, and let me illustrate this. Say you're out in the foyer out there, and uh, you overheard two of your friends talking, and one of them said to the other, um, I was in Bob's office the other day, and I saw this email that he got from Don... I couldn't believe what I was reading. I used to think that Don was a pretty nice guy. I mean, we had him preach here and things. But did you know that he likes watching TV programs that show bears eating people? I mean, I don't even know. That's just gross. Why would he do? I don't even know what channel would show that. Is that some sort of animals attack show or something? Why would he watch that? Well, let me show you the email that they were talking about. Here's what the email actually said. Hey, Bob, how about that game last Sunday? Wasn't it awesome to see the Bears start the season with a win over the hated Green Bay Packers? I especially love how the defense played. I tell you, there is nothing better than watching the Bears just devour people on Sunday afternoons. I think we had like seven sacks or something. What a game. Well, hopefully uh, you guys can make it over the house to watch this week's game. Just let us know, Don. There, now that you've read the full email... You can see that the friend out there took one sentence from the middle of it, and because they either didn't read the whole thing or they didn't understand what I was saying about football, they drew the wrong conclusion about what I like to watch on Sunday afternoons. 
They saw what I wrote, and they thought it meant something completely different than what I intended. Well, that's exactly what has happened with many of the verses in the Bible, including you reap what you sow, and several others that we're going to look at this morning in the book of Galatians. They're very popular, and they can make a difference in your life immediately, if not sooner, and properly understood, they can bring comfort, security, and clarity and direction to your life. That's the good news. The bad news is they also happen to be among the most misunderstood and misapplied passages in the Bible. As a result, they don't end up making much of a difference in people's lives because, well, that's karma. What goes around comes around. It's just these general statements that, well, everyone thinks they know. Well, we're going to fix that this morning, and I want to begin with that verse, you reap what you sow. It's found near the end of Galatians, but since we're looking at something that's in a letter from Paul, before we come to our final conclusions about what it means, we're going to have to read some earlier parts of the letter so that we can truly understand it and why Paul put that verse at the end of that email, at the end of that letter. So we'll look at it here. It's at the end in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, which says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. A man will reap what he sows. Now, if you stopped right there and you didn't read anything after that verse or anything before that verse, you might see why people think of it as they do. It almost looks like a proverb. But since this is a letter, we're going to have to see more. So look at the next verse, which says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap corruption from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. You see, there's nothing in these verses about you doing something to some other person. Only you and the Holy Spirit are even mentioned. And it has nothing to do with how you treat other people. Right away, we can see that you reap what you sow has nothing to do with karma or what goes around comes around. The people who think that are just like that person who read my email, took one sentence out of context, made up a meaning for it, and then they decided that I liked watching shows about bears eating people. Well, to say that you reap what you sow is like karma, is like reading Galatians and saying, well, bears eating people. It's not the meaning of that verse. You see, this verse is solely focused on you and the choice of seeds that you're going to sow in your life and the kind of harvest you can expect to see develop in your life based on that choice. Now, I want to show you something. Uh, here's an, uh, let's see, bring this slide up here. This is an apple. We're all good with that. Uh, and where do you go, or more specifically, where do people uh, who grow apples go to get them? Well, you go to an uh, apple tree. And how does one get an apple tree? Well, you sow apple seeds, of course. And how soon after you plant apple seeds do you get apples? A day? A week? No, it takes some time. Actually, it takes about six years, I looked it up. Uh, from the time that you plant apple seeds until you have trees that are at least producing edible apples. In the end, however, if you sow apple seeds, one day you'll get apples. Basically, that's all Paul is saying here. For us, there are only two types of seeds that we can sow. And therefore, there are only two things we can expect to reap in our lives. There are sow-to-the-flesh seeds, which he says produce corruption. And there are sow-to-the-spirit seeds, which produce eternal life. Different seeds, different tree, different harvest. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're at the end of the letter where he put this. And Paul is just using basic phrases, sow to the flesh and sow to the spirit and for the types of seeds we can sow. And, but he doesn't tell us how to do that. And he uses just these general terms, corruption and eternal life for the things that can be harvested. But he doesn't explain those in detail yet either. So we're going to need to look at the earlier parts of this letter, this email, to see if he was any more specific about what he had in mind. So turn back to chapter 3 in Galatians. And we're going to be at chapter 3, verse 1. And you'll see that he was more specific. The text says, 
You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was vividly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Hmm. I'm sure that got their attention. Sounds a little harsh. But it was necessary because these believers were in real danger here of going off the rails. Somehow, even though Paul had explained to them in vivid detail the events surrounding the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and exactly what that meant uh, for them, some person or some people in this group had started to convince these Galatians that Paul wasn't giving them the whole story and that they needed to listen to them in order to learn how they should live their lives after they were saved. And at this point, we get our first bit of information about those sow-to-the-flesh seeds that Paul said would produce a dangerous harvest. Look again at verses 2 through 3. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Okay. Their answer to Paul's first question would have been, well, by believing what we heard. You see, that's how they were saved. It wasn't based on good works or keeping the Old Testament law. They knew that. It was by grace, through faith. So Paul continues with a second question. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, having begun by hearing God's Word and believing it, are you now being perfected by the flesh, by your own works? If they were honest with Paul, it's the answer they'd have to give to this question that reveals the big problem. They began the Christian life in one way, through a work of the Holy Spirit, opening their minds to believe the Word of God and then do it. And then um, what they thought was, how do I continue now? Paul is asking them, why they now thought, if that's how they began, that they could become a more spiritually mature person by leaving the Word of God and the Holy Spirit over there on the sidelines and taking matters into their own hands, their own flesh. You see, Paul is telling them that by doing that, taking matters into their own hands and walking apart from the Spirit, they are sowing lots of seeds to the flesh. But what's worse is that Paul's question revealed that these believers didn't truly understand what happened to them when they were saved. Somehow, something went wrong in their thinking, and they began planting those sow-to-the-flesh seeds, those Old Testament law-keeping, those legalism seeds. Unfortunately, this happens to many Christians for the same reason. They don't really understand how salvation works which is why we need to be very careful when we share the gospel with people so that in our excitement to see them saved, we don't just say something like, um, uh, ask Jesus into your heart, he'll forgive your sins, you'll go to heaven when you die. There, that's all done. Now go along, have a nice life. The problem is, they're not exactly sure how they're supposed to live now that they've become a Christian. They may know that they should begin to be a better person, but how do they do that? And after one particularly bad day when they uh, cursed at someone in traffic or they uh, yelled at their spouse or um, snapped at their kids or whatever it was, they suddenly don't feel very saved. They remember that uh, someone told them that Jesus forgave their sins, but they got a whole bunch of new ones since then. And they don't even feel very secure in their position before God. Salvation starts to feel like this roller coaster. I'm saved. I've done a bunch of good things. Oh, I did some bad. I don't feel very saved. But now I've done some good things. I'm probably saved. Well, I did some bad. I don't feel very saved. And this is how they go through life, not feeling very secure. This is what the Galatians were dealing with. It was great that they had received the Holy Spirit and had their sins forgiven. But in their mind, they needed to come up with a plan 
for maintaining that right standing before God, for becoming more righteous and Christ-like, one that would help them feel more saved. And so they came up with a plan. It wasn't a good plan, which is why Paul called them foolish Galatians. But it was a plan. And the group who came up with this plan and began sharing it with the others were the Jewish Christians in this church who had grown up their whole lives following the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy, all of that. And before Jesus came, uh, they did that because they believed that's how they increased their level of righteousness and stayed in God's good graces. So they thought the best way to become more spiritually mature, more righteous now, was to begin keeping the law again, to start measuring my good works and see, uh, following all those rules, to see how I measure up so that, I stay, so that God's still happy with me. Well, here's the problem with their plan. It doesn't work. It never worked, and it can't work. And if that's not bad enough, all it amounts to is sowing to the flesh. In fact, all they did was simply come up with the first variety of sow-to-the-flesh seeds. These were the uh, work-to-prove-upon-my-salvation seeds. Now let me show you why their plan wasn't a good one, why it was a foolish plan. And let me show you how salvation works so at the same time, you never, ever have to have any of those am I really saved thoughts. And you'll never start sowing any of these work to improve upon my salvation or stay in God's good graces seeds. Now, I obviously didn't major in art at school or minor in art or know anything about art, so you'll have to forgive my drawing here. But this uh, first slide, this illustrates that the requirement in order to spend eternity with God, is that you must be in right standing with God. You have to have 100% righteousness. Now, I want you to imagine something like a, a metal detector over here. And what this is, is this is a level of righteousness detector. Uh, it's the law. It's God's word there. And what it does is it reveals, based on everything that God has said in his word, how close you are to being 100% perfect, 100% righteous. So you walk through the uh, level of righteousness detector and you get a report. And say you're a really good person and you get a 70%, okay? Well, you see, here's the problem. Even one sin would produce a report less than 100%. And since 100% is what's required to get in, no one's getting in. Well, this is a big problem. <laughs> so, God the Father sent the Son to be born of a virgin, live a perfect life, and show man what 100% righteousness looked like. So, when Jesus went through the level of righteousness detector, having fulfilled the law, having kept everything, because that's his character, that's who he was, well, he got a righteousness report, 100%. So, he was raised on the third day, and he ascended there to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He was 100%. He died for our sins, for our less than 100%, but he couldn't stay dead because he didn't die for any sin of his own. The Father had to resurrect him and raise him from the dead. He didn't, wasn't worthy of death because it weren't his sins. And so he's now at the right hand of the Father. So, here you are again, remember? You went through, you got your report, you look sad because you're at 70% or worse. And so you know what you need to do? Well, when you trust Christ, when you believe that Jesus paid the penalty for your sins on the cross, here's what happens. You get to toss your 70% in the garbage. You see, what happens is God then gives you Jesus's 100%. You are in right standing before God, and you get to spend eternity with God because God gave you Jesus's 100% righteousness. See, the problem with the Galatians' plan was having already done that, okay? They believed, they received the Spirit, they received Jesus's 100%, well, they decided that they could do better now at following the law. 
and that they would increase their love. They would stay in God, in right standing with God. And so what they would do is they said, I'm a better person now. So they would go over there and they would walk through the level of righteousness detector to see how good they were doing. And what happens when it measures your own righteousness? Well, they, uh, 70%, 71%. Uh, what do I do? Oh, yeah, I trust Christ. He gets rid of that, gives me his 100%. I, I already had that. Well, I'm doing better now, so I'm going to go through here again. 70%, what do I do? I trust Christ. I did that. He already gave me the 100%. Why do I keep? This is a dumb plan. I just keep going through this circle over and over again, which reveals that in my own righteousness, I'm never going to be 100%. I've already trusted Christ. He already gave me his 100%. I'm in right standing before God. My entrance into God's presence will be approved. What, what, why would I do that? It's a foolish plan to keep going back and trying to measure your own righteousness because you stand only on Jesus' righteousness. You're saved entirely because of what Jesus did for you. The day you put your trust in Jesus, God forgave you your sins, and he gave you his 100%, and no one can take that away because it's secure with Jesus in heaven. You already have all the righteousness you'll ever need. So trying to improve on your level of righteousness to become more righteous, sir, by following the law or certain rules or doing good work, that won't work. As Paul writes in Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You've put on Jesus' 100% righteousness. Nothing you can ever do will make you more righteouser. Because you can't get more than 100%. And nothing you will ever do can make you less righteouser because you can't reduce Jesus' 100%. There you have it, Galatians. Why are you coming up with this foolish plan? You see, one day when you stand before God the Father and he asks you, why should I let you into my presence? Well, just point to Jesus. I'm with him. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I hope that on that day, I'm able to even get those words out of my mouth. I made it with him. Uh, he paid the penalty for my sins. He gave me, it's his 100%. Don't look at mine. Look at his. I am wearing Christ's 100%. That's why I get to be in his presence forever. It's all Jesus. There will be no room for boasting or gloating or pride because none of us will be there based on anything that we have done. It will all be because of what Jesus has done for us and given to us. That's fantastic. Now, to be fair to the Galatians, uh, not everyone there in Galatia was following that first plan. Not everyone was trying to become more righteouser by keeping the law and improving their own self-righteousness as if, as if they could, you know, get rid of Jesus' hundred and then stand before God. I've now achieved 100%, which you can't. Dumb plan. Not everyone was like that. There was another group, and they also came up with their own foolish plan. Uh, they weren't as big as that first group, uh, the work on, to improve on my salvation group, but Paul did have some words for them as well. In Galatians 5, 13, he tells them, You Galatians, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh. Don't sow to the flesh, but through love serve one another. Okay, you see what happened is, although these were people who actually understood how salvation worked, they decided that because they didn't have to worry about losing Jesus' 100%, and because nothing they could do to add uh, would add to their righteousness, uh, that meant that they were free to do whatever they wanted. Who cares about doing good things or helping other people? It doesn't make me any more righteous. And who cares if I party or drink or do drugs or have sex or, you know, live it up? Because all my sins are already forgiven. And I'm not losing any righteousness either. And I live for fun. I live to 
party, music, whatever makes me happy as long as it doesn't hurt someone. You know, I'm doing it. Well, and with that, they came up with the second variety of sow to the flesh seeds. There's where the, uh, I can live however I want seeds. Unfortunately, this is by far the favorite theological error of young people. If you're a young people, <laughs> pay attention. See, once young people find out that they're, all their sins, past, present, and future, have been forgiven, and that doing good works doesn't make you more righteous because you have Jesus' 100%, they don't see any downside to ignoring God's word and doing whatever they want. Hey, I can't lose my salvation. I have Jesus 100%. I can do whatever I want. So there. Yeah. Well, they then take that philosophy with them, and they head off to college, and they find thousands of other Christians and non-Christians alike all doing those same things. Well, except they go to church on Sunday morning when the parents come to visit, so it looks good, and mom and dad keep paying for college. See, they've worked that out. But young people, I want you to listen, because if you're thinking that after you saved, that you can just live however you want, because it doesn't matter, you're making a major mistake. Remember, the text said, you will reap what you sow. And if you live that way, if you're just living to uh, satisfy your own desires because you don't think there will be any consequences because you can't lose your salvation, well, keep in mind that Paul said one day you'll reap corruption. Wow, that's a fun word when you're a young person. Uh, dude, I don't even know what corruption means. So I think I'm still good. I'm not that worried if I reap corruption. Uh, well, Hold on, Paul's going to be a lot more specific about what that means. You see, now that Paul has pointed out the wrong thinking of both of these groups, he now turns his attention to providing the, the clarity, the explanation, the details, and direction they're going to need uh, to follow, and all believers need, really, to live the right way. Look at verse, chapter 5, verse 16. Here's what he wants you to do. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And down in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, we're saved. Let us also walk by the Spirit. Okay, stay with me here. If, we're, if walking apart from the Spirit is the same as sowing seeds to the flesh, then walking by the Spirit must be sowing seeds to the Spirit. And because there is great benefit in sowing those seeds, we want to make sure that that's what we're doing. The question is, how? How do you walk by the Spirit? Now, I'm not going to do it, but if I had you come up here and explain in the most specific, concrete terms possible what it means to walk by the Spirit, what would you say? Just think about that. Most Christians recognize that it's important to walk by the Spirit, because the Bible says they should walk by the Spirit. But when you ask them how specifically they are to walk by the Spirit, how they do it, well, it tends to get a little fuzzy at that point. You get a lot of answers like, uh, well, I just try to uh, tune in to what I feel the Spirit is telling me to do. Uh, I just try to make sure that there's this moment-by-moment -moment guidance as if the Spirit is just sort of moving me around in some way, and I'm just dependent on Him to keep bumper car and me around. Or I just keep myself open to whatever the Spirit tells me to do. We just have this direct, He just tells me what to do, and I do it. Now, I don't mean to you know, make light of their answers, because it's, it, they're kind of fuzzy, and a lot of it's our fault. We don't explain in concrete terms what it what it means, but what they're basically saying is that walking by the Spirit isn't much different than uh, walking by, let's see here, I brought a prop, uh, by walking by the magic eight ball. Did any of you ever have one of these when you were a kid? You remember the magic eight ball? Uh, the magic eight ball is one of these things where uh, you ask it yes or no questions, you shake it up, and then it, it gives you an answer. So I said, let's see, should I preach for another two hours? As I see it, yes. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Uh, will everyone stick around for another two hours? Uh, out outlook, not so good. Ah, 
But, but should they stick around for all two hours? <laughs> Signs point to yes. Okay, well, there you have it. Uh, the magic eight ball has spoken. Uh, we've got lots of time left. So we'll move on from Galatians right into Ephesians. We'll walk through that. Uh, now, <laughs> I'm being ridiculous, of course. Uh, but the point is, as long as we're the ones asking the questions we can pretty much control the answers and the outcome of what we want to do. And for many people who aren't sure what it means to walk by the Spirit, life is very much like walking or living by the magic eight ball, and that lives to problems. They want to please God, but they haven't read much of the Bible, and so when situations come up and they don't know what to do, they think, well, I'll just, I'll just walk by the Spirit and He'll tell me what to do, and the problem is they're the ones asking the question. Let's see, I'm driving down the road. That person, should I stop and help them? I think the Spirit's saying no, because I've got to get over to Bob's house over here. You know, oh, that, that missionary's in need. Should I, should, do I need to support them? Outlook not so good. That's true, I need my own money. I'm not going to, you know. We ask the questions, we come up with the own ans- our own answers, and then we say that, well, the, the sp- I'm walking by the Spirit here. The Spirit told me to do that. And we need to be very careful that when we're asking the questions, we're not generating our own answers and then blaming it on God. How do we handle this situation? How do we, what are the checks here to know that? <coughs> because you see, excuse me, These ideas of just sort of walking around or whatever, none of those concepts or ideas are ever found in Galatians or anywhere else in the Bible. Paul never tells the Galatians that they should just try to feel or sense when the Holy Spirit is telling them something to do. He never mentions anything that you'll have this moment-by-moment guidance that you'll never be able to go off the rails here if, if you do something. Because our minds generate all sorts of things all the time, and we rationalize and justify our own behaviors all the time, and then we blame it on God. You see, Paul has specific things in mind, and they're nothing mystical or fuzzy or anything about what Paul has in mind. So what does he mean? Well, walk by the Spirit appears nowhere else in the Bible except this letter. So Paul must have very, something very specific in mind, which will correct this behavior in the Galatians, these two groups, and that are walking apart from the Spirit. And he does. Paul tells them that they need to walk by the Spirit. What he means is that believers need to live their lives by doing two things. First, it means that we must always remember that we have Jesus' 100% righteousness as a gift to us. We didn't earn it. We don't get more righteouser. And there isn't a life of pride and boasting and, and I need this, and I did because I'm righteous. We're all there only with him. That's the first key to living a life that's walking by the Spirit. Remember, this was the primary failure of that first group, that group of Jewish Christians. They forgot this, and they began to walk apart from the Spirit by working to improve their level of righteousness and maintaining their right standing through their good works. That's not how walk by the Spirit looks. They thought that they had to keep doing these things in order to keep their 100% or to earn their way back to what they had lost. The Spirit doesn't tell you that. That's walking apart from the Spirit. You see, just like it was at the moment you were saved when the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to see that you were a sinner in need of a Savior, so it is if you let Him, the Holy Spirit will continue to remind you that you have been given Jesus' 100%. Some of you, as I said that, you say amen. That's the work of the Spirit, to know I have been given Jesus' 100%. And that alone is what keeps me in right standing before God. You'll never have anything but Jesus' 100%. Knowing that, then, how am I to live each day? What does it look like to walk by the Spirit as I go along? Well, believing that I have Jesus 100%. The second thing is, well... Learning and doing what God's Word says. That seems simple. Remember, this was the primary failure of that second group, the ones who thought they could live however they wanted. 
See how this corrects the two types of walk apart from the spirit seeds? This was the group, they could live however they want. They had their sow to the flesh seeds. There were no consequences to that. Well, look again back at uh, chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? By believing the Word of God. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Notice that Paul reminds them that they became believers by hearing God's word and believing it, by doing it. He now says they're foolish because although they began that way, they're now trying to live their lives according to their own human reasoning, asking their own questions, which is telling them, well, I, got, I can live however I want. The Bible would never say that. <laughs> if you began one way, what sense does it make to start living another way? Now you may say, well, I understand how that addresses the error of this second group, this live however I want group. But help me here, I don't understand how, that, how doing God's word is the same thing as, as how is that part of walking by the Spirit? I understand the Bible, how is that walking by the Spirit? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, look at what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 through 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, all the things you need to walk and live, that the man of God may be capable and equipped for every good work. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, Peter writes, Above all, you do well if you recognize this. No prophecy of Scripture ever comes about by the prophet's own imagination, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. <clears throat> and look what Jesus himself told the apostles in John chapter 14, verses 25 through 26. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. In other words, just like the prophets in the Old Testament, all of your New Testament is the result of the Holy Spirit working through the apostles, this time reminding them of all that Jesus taught them and said to them while they were living together so that they could write it down for us to know and read and walk by. We walk by the Spirit when we walk when we live by what the Spirit told them to write down. You see, what this means is that there's no reason to go around wondering uh, what the Holy Spirit wants me to do. I, what does the Holy Spirit want me to do? He told me. He told them. They wrote it down. Men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is what the Holy Spirit inspired men to write down. This is what God wants me to know. So, what do I need to do? Well, I better learn <laughs> what the Holy Spirit told them to write, and then do what God's Word says. You see, walking by the Spirit is living in obedience to the Holy Spirit-inspired Scriptures. You will be walking by the Spirit when you do that. You will be doing what the Spirit says you are to do in life because this is what the Spirit said to do in life. It's not fuzzy or tricky or uncertain. I can know because people moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God and it's written down. But you have to know what the Bible says or you won't reap the benefit that comes from walking by the Spirit. And just what exactly is that benefit of walking by the Spirit? What will I reap from those seeds that I sow to the Spirit? Well, remember that Paul said that you'd either reap corruption or eternal life. You know, the young people, you get corruption, they live however they want, or eternal life. Well, I want you to look at chapter 5 in Galatians, verse 19 through 21, and now he's going to give details about this corruption thing. The live however I want. What do I get from that? And young people, you know, pay attention. Here are the details of what results from a life that's the live however I want approach. Now, the works of the flesh are, flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. 
Notice, first of all, this isn't even a comprehensive list. Paul ends with, and things like these. In other words, this list is just to give you an idea of the kind of things that qualify as corruption. If you look carefully at this list, you'll see the things that the two groups we've been talking about are sure to reap. The ones who are trying to improve their level of righteousness are bound to begin reaping jealousy and envy. As soon as someone who in this church is less righteouser than them starts getting credit for something that they deserve because I was good, I deserve the righteousness credit on my account because that, I need that so I can get back to my... You're already at 100%. You're walking apart from it. You've missed it. That's why you don't do that. For the live however I want group, it's not too much of a stretch to see that all of them become involved in sexual immorality and impurity. This is most certainly the group among whom you would find people struggling with drunkenness and outbursts of anger. This is the type of things that become part of your life when you're not walking by the Spirit. And if you think you're safe because you don't see your particular character flaw in this list, remember, and things like these. In other words, Paul is saying that whatever traits from this list you see in other people that you know are bad, or whatever traits from this list are the things, uh, and things like these that are a part of your character that uh, you are embarrassed are there, well, they didn't get there because you were learning God's Word and doing it. Walking by the Spirit. They didn't get there because you were doing that. Sowing seeds to the Spirit. They didn't get there because you were doing that. What you see in yourself is the harvest that, eventually got, that you eventually got from walking apart from the Spirit and sowing to the flesh. A harvest of sinful behavior and corrupt character. But it doesn't need to be that way. We can turn it around and begin to change what we're like and what other people see when they look at us. And it won't happen overnight. You don't get apples from apple seeds the next day. But eventually, you will reap what you sow. Look at verses 22 and 23 of chapter 5 which are even more popular than you reap what you sow. Here Paul gives us details about this eternal life. And it's important to remember, eternal life isn't just something you get when you die. When you receive the Spirit of God, your eternal life began now. You now have God's life that you will have with you for eternity. And so from that moment that you were saved, Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Like before, Paul is describing in these verses character traits that will develop in a person based on the type of seeds they'll sow. In this case, walking by the Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit. It produces a Christ-like character. Do you ever wonder, you know, why did Paul call this list of traits the fruit of the Spirit? I mean, it's a cute phrase. It's on about a bazillion things at a Christian bookstore. You can find every bookmark and plaque or sign. Fruit of the Spirit. Here they all are. Uh, we know a lot of them in there. Was Paul just trying to be cute? Well, since this is a letter and it all flows together, can you see now why Paul might use this phrase? Remember our apple. It's a fruit. If you sow apple seeds, you get fruit. You get apples. If you sow to the Spirit, you'll get fruit of the Spirit. See, Paul is working here in the sowing and reaping and the type of thing you'll get. It's important that you remember, you don't plant fruit to get fruit. You don't have anything to do with producing the, the fruit. I mean, you can, uh, uh, people will tell you you need to work on your patience or uh, you need to just start having more joy. Just be more joyous. The problem is you're trying to create fruit by your own work. All you can do is sow the seeds and then water them. Walk by the Spirit by doing what God's Word says and guess what? One day they're going to grow into a tree and produce fruit in your life. If you walk by the Spirit, if you sow to the Spirit, one day 
you will reap the fruit of the Spirit. And that's what the type of person you'll be. Paul is saying, whatever traits from this list you see in other people that are good, whatever traits from this list you want to become a part of your character that you know will make your Heavenly Father uh, just so happy and demonstrate how thankful you are that you were given Jesus' 100%, they're only going to get there by learning and doing what God's Word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says. Period. You reap what you sow. So, why does all that matter? Well, we began in Galatians 6, 7, which said, Do not be, see, be deceived. God is not mocked. Uh, another way this verse is translated is, Do not be misled. God will not be made a fool of or outwitted. If there was ever a reason to abandon one of these plans that they came up with and pay attention to what you've heard from God's word, uh, this would be it. God has your best interests in mind, and all he's trying to do is keep the corruption that's in this world from becoming a part of your life and your character. Why would you want to try to come up with your own plan and outwit God? Are you dying to get a letter from him, you foolish Azelins, Azel, Azelillians, Bri Briarians? No. But not only will God not be mocked, but you'll reap what you sow. Here's the thing. Although most people, and this is another example, most people use this verse as some sort of warning. Hey, what goes around comes around. That, nothing to do with it. It's not a warning, really. It's a promise. It just depends on how you want to live. You see, think of it that way. See, if I sow to the Spirit, if I walk according to God's Word, I'm going to reap the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to reap what I sow. That's a promise. It's only a warning if I say, I'm going to live however I want. Well, be aware, you're going to reap corruption. You're going to reap a terrible character that is displeasing to God. That's the warning. You're doing what the Holy Spirit inspired people to write in God's Word. It's a promise. I'm going to reap what I sow, I can take it to the bank. Hopefully that should make you very excited about the plan that God has for helping you develop a more Christ-like character. Remember, it's just like when you sow apple seeds, one day you get apples. If you sow to the Spirit, one day you'll get the fruit of the Spirit. That's how you develop into this type of person. And it's important because you'll be a more effective witness for Jesus in a world that desperately needs to hear about him. The choice is yours. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ, I hope that my clumsy artwork aside, um, you recognize that no matter how hard you try going through that level of righteousness detector, you're never going to get to 100% on your own. If you understand that now, all you have to do is believe that Jesus paid the penalty for your sins, that he died in your place on the cross, and he rose from the dead. And if you believe that, he'll give you his 100%. And you can leave here today absolutely certain that no matter what life may hold for you, you'll spend eternity in God's presence because I'm with him. If you're here and you've already trusted Christ... It's a comfort knowing that our salvation is secure because it doesn't depend on the success of our economy or the stock market or housing prices or our job or our own efforts. It's secure entirely because it rests on what Jesus has already done. So this week, take some time to reflect on that and tell him how thankful you are for what he did for you. This is what I like to do sometimes is just imagine yourself. Just in your mind's eye when you have a quiet time, just imagine that you're standing before God and getting to hear, why should I let you hear? And every time it's just, I'm with him. It's all him. I'm here because he gave me his righteousness, not any of my own. I'm telling you, when I do, it gives me goosebumps. It makes Jesus be fantastic. It's all of him and none of me, and I feel great because that tells me all about God's grace and love and compassion 
and the Savior who died for me. It's Him. I'm with Him. Wow. And then, because you have that, start diligently learning what God's Word says and do it. Walk by the Spirit each day. Walk by what the Spirit has already told us to do. If you don't know how to study it, uh, find, as quickly as possible, find someone who's doing it and, uh, and get with them and start getting into God's Word. If you have the how-to knowledge, you've been studying for a long time, uh, find more ways to study and to help others who need it. Because North Texas desperately needs more people who truly know God's Word because there are way too many people out there who are making a mess of it. And as a result, there are too many people who are bringing in a bitter harvest because they don't know about the seeds they're sowing in their life. And they need to hear from us. The promise we have, walk by the Spirit, sow to the Spirit, and you'll reap the fruit of the Spirit. You will reap what you sow. Thank God for that. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. Um, every time I am in your word, you are more awesome every time. I thank you so much that you loved us. Thank you so much that you sent the Son, Jesus, that, that you would go to the cross for us, that you would show us what righteousness looked like, and that you would give us yours. You didn't have to. You did because you loved us. And Father, I pray this week that you will allow your Spirit to work in us as we read and study and immerse ourselves in the things that he has caused men to write down that we have in our Bible. What a gift it is to be able to have the words inspired by the Spirit so that we can do them and develop in our lives to be the type of people that can share with others the great promise that they'll get what you're willing to give them, Father. It's a gift. They'll stand before you based on all that Jesus has done. Pray that you'll strengthen us and open our eyes to be able to understand all that you've told us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.